Hey, it's Rod Yates here. Thanks for joining me on another episode of Humans of Music, a Jackster podcast. Each episode, I talk to a music creator or industry professional about their life and career, the ups and downs of their journey, and the lessons they've learned. And my special guest today is singer-songwriter Curtis Harding, who recently released his latest full-length record, If Words Were Flowers. It's the third record from an artist who's been surrounded by music all his life. His mother was a gospel singer and Curtis spent much of his childhood travelling with his family from town to town as his mum performed in churches and helped spread the word, immersing young Curtis in the world of gospel music. In fact, music stretched far and wide throughout his family, exposing him to the worlds of R&B, soul, hip-hop and rock and roll, as you're about to find out in this interview. In his mid-teens, Curtis's family settled in Atlanta, and within a few years, Curtis was an active member of the local hip-hop community, performing with the group Proceed and doing promotional work for LaFace Records, the label founded by L.A. Reid and Babyface. He got his break when he went on the road singing backups with CeeLo Green and performing on his debut album, all of which helped school Curtis in the ways of the music business. Curtis was also there when CeeLo teamed up with Danger Mouse to form Niles Barkley, and Danger Mouse would go on to play a pivotal role in Curtis's career when he co-produced Curtis's second solo album, Face Your Fear. That was the follow-up to Curtis's 2014 debut, Soul Power, a record that drew on the soul, gospel and R&B of his upbringing, while incorporating elements of garage rock, funk and blues. He expands on that sound on his new album, If Words Were Flowers. And we started the interview by talking about the title of the record. The title was inspired by a phrase that your mum used to say, so give me my flowers while I'm still here, which in other words, from what I understand, means give me my dues while I'm still alive. Don't wait till I'm dead to give me my dues. Is that the, the meaning of that saying? Yeah, in, in part, but it's also... It means that, but it also means just to pick your words wisely. You know, when speaking to strangers, to loved ones, acquaintances, anybody, you know, it's just like, just try to uh, use positivity as much as you possibly can. I'm a huge believer in just like speaking things into existence. So I think the more that we practice choosing our words, just like flowers for whatever occasion, even when we're speaking in anger, there's a way that you can kind of articulate and represent yourself to where it's not degrading or demeaning. Um, and I'm, I'm a victim and I'm also guilty of, you know, saying some things that are not, a, not very positive, but it's just a, a reminder um, for me and for everybody else to, to be conscious of our loved ones, say positive things, give them their flowers, but also just to pick our words wisely. Mm. Have you always had that positivity? I think it's always been there. I haven't always been positive. I'm not always positive. <laughs> that's that's just being human, you know what I'm saying? Sure. But I think uh I think with anything you get better at it the more that you practice and the more that you do. Yeah. So is it something that you were raised with that that sentiment or is that something that you've learned over the years? Yeah, I think my parents were pretty good at trying to give me a positive uh insight on on everything, a perspective. Uh but I think at some point you have to have your own you have to use your own intuition and your own guidance. But yeah, my parents it, it started it started with with that. I mean, it's a very apt sentiment for 2021 with what everything we've witnessed over the past couple of years and leading up to that, but it really seems to have intensified over the past couple of years with the division in society. Was that why that uh, title seemed com- particularly relevant for now? Yeah, I mean, that and then just as like also you, you've seen during protests, you've seen a lot of signs with words on, you know what I'm saying? You've seen a lot of murals from all of the um, the people murdered just a lot of angry talk um, within the news and just like everything being politicized. And it it all stems from the words that we say Mm. in baiting and baiting, you know? So yeah, it's it's all of that. Okay. Words are very important. Yeah. And I know that you had finished a version of the album pre-lockdown and then once COVID hit and we went into lockdown, you ended up going back and revisiting it and I guess, uh, adding some new songs or reworking some older songs. And I think I've seen you say that it was at that point that, uh, I guess, conceptually, the album really took shape. Everything we've been speaking about now, were they themes that were still in that first version of the record? Or did they sort of, is that what you were talking about when you were reworking and finding the conceptual spirit of the record? Is that when these themes were introduced? Yeah, some of it. But I mean, like, everything that I'm I'm saying in this album has been going on for years like before I was born like within my father's lifetime our grand 
father, grandparents' lifetime. It's been going on forever. So I think this is just something that has been brought to light. Even without COVID and without the Black Lives Matter movement, this album would be relevant. You mm. know what I'm saying? Because mm. the same shit has been going on for as long as we can remember. I think that COVID and just like with uh, technology, we're just able to kind of to see it and it's up in our face. So, yeah, this is this is this is a nothing new, man. Yeah. There is an element of hope to the record, though. You know, even in the song Hopeful, where you talk about we're in the middle of a monotonous storm, you also say the lights will shine through till this bullshit blows by. What are those? What are those? Like, where do you see that hope? Where do you see those lights? Within uh, our communities, man, within like within our children, uh, within within the music that I hear, um, within the words that 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 we speak. And it's like, even if you haven't personally come into contact with it, it's there. I mean, if if you don't have hope, then I feel sorry for you. Like, what what the hell do you have if you don't have hope? Mm. You know, that's that is the defining quality for to to keep going to keep living you know what i'm saying like you have to have that mm. that's a necess- that's a necessary ingredient and thematically that was something that you wanted to really shine through on the record when you went into it i wanted to shine through within my my uh my life you know what i'm saying it, it, yeah. it doesn't just ha- it doesn't just have to be on 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 a record so i i like i said again it's like i'm i believe that i'm a huge believer in speaking things into existence even if even if we don't see it, mm-hmm. even if we don't feel it, it's like you have to be almost your own shaman. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta push things forward, man, in a positive, positive fashion. And it's like I don't want, like in music, in a large degree, music and film and art is immortalization. And it's like if this was one of the last things that I've said, I don't want to like leave some bullshit because it's my legacy. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like I'm going to try to say as much positive. Uh, shit as I can. Nice, nice. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> so what's what was the biggest difference between the two records, the record pre-COVID and the record that you ended up releasing? Uh, for me, it was just like flow. It just didn't it didn't flow right. I'm a, I'm a big uh, I love like listening to albums all the way down. I don't like to skip tracks, and and it didn't feel right to me. It's that's not to say that the songs weren't good and that people wouldn't have liked the album as much as they like this one, but. It was for me. Mm. I was like, it's, it just doesn't feel right to me. So I have to like it first. Um, so I, I just made that decision because I had more time. It was like, you know, I turned it in. I was like, well, everything is going to shit now. We got, I, I can just sit down and really refine the record. And, mm. um, you know, so I did that. I took that time and I, I tried to use it as positively as I could, you know. Yeah. I think it worked out. I think it did. Well, I've seen you talking in <laughs> interviews saying that even though you weren't happy with it, all a lot of the people around you were, and they were saying that this is a great record. Where, have you always had that uh, that self belief? I guess that that um, ability to trust your instincts and to know, well, you know, even though everyone else is saying this is good for me, it's not quite right. Yeah, I think you got to have that, man. Like that that uh, speaks to what I was just saying. It's like you got to have it within yourself to kind of know, like know that self and know how you feel. And I didn't feel a hundred percent. On, um, and I don't know if I ever, I don't even know if I felt 100% about turning if words with flowers in as it is right now, but I felt a whole lot better. And and that's just that's just like, you know, the artist insecurity part too. Mm. And, and that's why I say like, that doesn't mean that the last stuff wasn't good. It just like, I just felt that I could do better. You know what yeah. I mean? It's just like an athlete. It's like, oh, I, I didn't score like my point, percentage point per game. That doesn't mean you didn't have a good game. You know what I mean? But, you know, you can always do better. And I had the time to do that. Have you always had strong instincts in that regard, though? I've always had strong instincts. I don't know if uh, they're all the, always right, <laughs> but I think the older that you get and the more experience that you get under the belt, under your belt, the the easier it is to uh, to make the right decisions. Um, and it, it all stems from experience and just knowing, um, just knowing what uh, what sounds right and what feels right. Sure, hopeful. The song "Hopeful" um, is this amazing amalgam of styles. Uh, you know, from hip hop, soul, Motown, pop, it's all in there. And it sounds like it was a song that took quite a process to get to that. It was like a journey to get to the finished product. Was it, was that a long song? Did that song have a long gestation? Yeah, it did. Initially it came from three demos that I had and we kind of Frankenstein that, uh, hopeful together. But initially I was kind of singing the, uh, the verses and it didn't, again, it didn't, feel right. I was mm. like, I, I need to do and I need to say more. So 
I kind of just dove back into some old lyrics that I had from like my hip hop, uh, my hip hop days, and and threw it on there, man. And it, and it it worked. It really worked, and it felt good. And we got uh, the girls on there to sing the choruses, and that's what you got. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Put some put put some psychedelic guitar on there, and you know, put some uh, put a put a breakdown in there, and and it worked. Yeah. So isn't that interesting that the the songs, the lyrics you'd written years ago were as relevant today as they were back then. They still fit with what you were saying on the record. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's and that's exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> same same shit, different day. Yeah. Does it is it hard to we we were talking earlier about being positive. Is it hard? Does it become harder to maintain a positivity when you realize that you have been the things you're seeing about now? You'd actually written back then the, the same shit, different day. I mean, it takes practice. You know, it's just like anything. I think is you know you don't ever want living to seem like a job, but sometimes it does. You know what I'm saying? You wake up and you look at the world around you, and it's kind of falling to pieces, so to speak. But there are a lot of beautiful things that you have to consider too. And that makes it easier to uh, to maintain your hope and to know that, you know, there's a brighter day because I, I do believe that things are better than they were, but we still have, you know, a lot, a lot further to go. Mm. What about the title track, which starts the record and it starts with that beautiful horn section and then that chorus of voices comes in and it, it, the song just takes a right <laughs> turn from this, I guess, sort of more soul and, and Motown inspired beginning to this psychedelic chorus of voices what how, how did that song come about i wanted to do like an instrumental i had no intention of, of really putting any lyrics on there whatsoever i just wanted like a vibe and i i had i didn't know where it was going to fit on the album i was just really just diving into it um i don't i don't like make music and have it all structured out and laid out i kind of just feel it and just do whatever I, i'm feeling at the moment and then kind of piece it together after i have a body of a uh, body of work and it just felt right to open the album up uh, with, uh, with with that track after I had put the lyrics on there and um, got the girls and stuff together mm. to sing it. I wanted it to feel like a uh, like an opening of a play or something, or like a you know like a opus in, in the beginning of a film or something. So yeah, and it worked. It yeah. really did. And so, it kind of, uh, does it set the tone in some ways for what follows? I think it does. I think it does. Yeah, and I struggled. I was like, should I just open it up with hopeful and then bring this in towards the middle? But I was like, no, it's like everyone always tries to open the album up with like loud drums or just, you know what I'm saying? And I was mm -hmm. like, no, let's let's set the mood, you know, because that was kind of the uh, sentiment of lockdown for me. It was a lot of space and it was just really quiet. And, you know, I had I had time to kind of reflect and, and think about, you know, have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> so and that's that's what it felt like. I saw an interview with you where you were talking about, I think it was 10 things that inspired the record. One of the things you said was uh, mythology and constellations. Right. In, in what way were mythology and constellations an inspiration on the album? Just storytelling. Just, you know, just the, um, the stories from, from, uh, from Greek mythology and just mythology period are just amazing about how, you know, someone would go down to Hades to rescue their love or like... You know, they would go through these trials, whatever, to uh, to obtain uh, a constellation of their own or whatever. Like, I think those stories are beautiful. And just like metaphorically speaking, I think it's a testament to like humanity and just like some of the things that we have to face within our day to day. Mm. So that's very inspiring, you know, to know that someone can overcome like these crazy situations and, and come out on top. Or not, you know what I'm saying? That's life as well, too. Yeah. Where'd that fascination come from? Is that something that you grew up uh, did you learn it at school? Were you just naturally drawn to to mythology and constellations? I mean, yeah, we learned some of that stuff at school, but yeah, definitely, it's a natural uh, curiosity of mine. Mm. Um, you know, I don't know, like for me to think back way to elementary school and is that's that's a that's a far uh, far reach, but <laughs> sure. But I I still love that stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we spoke earlier about. Uh, your mother and you know the, the phrase "Give me my fly out flowers while I'm still here." Mm -hmm. um, what what kind of woman was was your mother or is your mother? Is she still with us? Yeah, she's here. Okay. She's around. What kind of what kind of woman um, is she? she uh, she's a very strong willed, opinionated, talented, liberal, smart, beautiful, diverse, fashionable, stylish, 
woman. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you act, so I told you. <laughs> no, that's great. She sounds like an incredible role model. <laughs> yeah, she's, you know, she has her things just like everybody else. And we don't always see eye to eye, but um, it's fine. I mean, that's that's a reflection of, of the world. My mother raised me to... Uh, to stand on my own and to to stick to my own guns and to and to have my own opinions, you know what I'm saying? So mm. it's it's good even when we don't agree, you know what I'm saying? It's just like that's that's why we have conversations and that's why we try to talk things through. Yeah. Um it's it's been well documented your upbringing, the fact that your mom was a gospel singer and you traveled a lot when you were very young. Uh your mother and your father would travel around America and to other countries and spread the word of God basically, sing in churches, perform um, outreach, or even helping to start churches. Um, And I think I've seen you describe that you're almost literally like missionaries. You know, you'd hand out stuff if the church had food programs, or or sometimes you'd sleep in the church, or sometimes you'd sleep in the vans. What what years is this happening in in terms of like, how old are you when when you were living that transient lifestyle? I was very young. I was from like the age of seven or eight. Up until my teenage years, up until I was like 14 or 15 or 16 or something like that, Mm. until we settled in Atlanta. And then we were still kind of doing some of that stuff even when I was younger. Um, She would convince me (laughs) to to still get up and do some of that stuff. Um, Even though when I started getting older, I started having a difference of opinion on how to do some of the things that, uh, that we were doing. But it was all good. I think like if your heart is in the right place then it's it's a beautiful thing you know what i'm saying yeah but you know you t- you take you take the good from every experience at least i take the good from every experience and, and everything that i've i've had and and try to like form my own you know what i'm saying spirituality out of that mm. it must have really exposed you to a wide section of society a very diverse section of society i think you've said that um you know your mom would even do outreach with gang members um or obviously there there are people who um are perhaps poor or living in poverty and you're exposed to all of this. Did it give you a wider understanding of the the human condition? I think so. I think as a child, you know, as as a younger as a younger person going through it, you don't really process it the way that you would looking back as an adult. And as an adult, it definitely um opened me up and exposed me to a lot because you don't really think about that kind of stuff when you're going through it. It's just life. You know what I'm saying? You're just living it. But then when you're faced with like encountering someone like that or anybody, you know what I'm saying? You're just like, oh, I've, I've been here before. And it's because of this, you know what I'm saying? Because I've already, because I've literally been there before. So yeah, it, it opens you up, man. And it gives you a different perspective and it's easier to, uh, to kind of get involved with, with, uh, what's going on. I mean, the legend is that as a toddler, you literally grew up at your mom's feet watching her sing. Is, is that, is that realistic or is that mythical now? <laughs> I don't know. Let's <laughs> let's uh let's let's keep it things of legend. <laughs> I I love mythology, so that's it. Know, it's, it's it sounds good. <laughs> How does it feel? <laughs> but you would see your mum perform in churches. That was clearly a pivotal uh, experience for you in terms of witnessing music being made and witnessing your mother singing. Yeah, and and not just her, just like the musicians. My godfather was a. Uh, amazing bass player. My sister is like amazing piano player. And just the experience, like I'm from Saginaw, Michigan. I was born in Saginaw, Michigan. So like that's the home of Stevie Wonder. And and it's like Motown. It's not too far from there. It's like 90 miles north of, of Saginaw. And my father is from Henny's, Tennessee, by way of Memphis. My uncle had a singing group with Isaac Hayes. And like my other uncles really was best friends with B.B. King. So just like all of that stuff played a part. I had a well-rounded musical uh, experience when I was young. So I think all of that played a part in in, uh, my musical development. And it must have seemed completely natural to you. Like you're you're telling me this and and I'm going, wow. But for you, it just must have seemed like, yeah, that's, it's natural. This is what, were you thinking this is what every family's like? Yeah, kind of. (laughs) I didn't really look at, I didn't look at music as something that I could do professionally. Cause I didn't know, I had no understanding of how you would get paid from it or any of that stuff. All that came later. I thought that music was just something that everybody kind of did, you know? Um, it was only until I realized that not everybody does it, you know? Because mm-hmm. when you think about it, all, ch- all children sing, like all children sing. That's how you learn. At some point when you grow up, you just stop. 
I think I just kind of just kept doing it, you know what I'm saying? Because my mother was doing it. Mm. But for my recollection, I just remember singing with kids in school and it's like, I was like, oh, everyone does this, you know? Okay. But yeah, it's, it's just a natural progression for me. Um, I had other aspirations of things that I wanted to do in my life. Um, I wanted to be an oceanographer. I wanted to. I had. I wanted to be archaeologist at one point. It had all all kinds of dreams and aspirations. But music was always something I was like, huh? I do this anyways. I, I would always do this, and I still feel the same way. It's like if I was still washing dishes or had like if I was still a garbage man or something, I would still be making music just because I love it and it's therapeutic. Yeah. Did you ever go down the like seriously pursue oceanography or anything like any of those other pastimes that you just mentioned? Those other interests. No, I mean, I read books, but no, we moved around too much. Yeah. And that was, uh, that was one of the things that kind of, uh, stopped me from doing a lot, but I think my calling, this was my calling, you know, mm. like I love to do it. And again, it's like, I tell anybody, it's like any, any young person that aspires to do anything, it was like, what would you do anyways? Like, even, you know what I'm saying? Like if, if you can figure out a way to make money at that, like, even if you just, or work at another job. Like if whatever you would do, whatever you love to do, try to, you know, if you can figure out a way to make money doing it, then that's what you should do. Mm. You know, if you're trying to pick a career path and music, that was music for me. Okay. And I, I want to talk to you about the time in your life when you figured out how to make money from it. But before we get to there, in terms of your first performances, were they alongside your mom, harmonizing with your mother in church? Were they your first public performances? Uh, I think it was with my sisters. Okay. Because I started playing drums in church. So I was a, I was a drummer. So I would play with like, they called them praise and worship. So I would drum alongside them and uh, my sisters would sing. I rarely sang with my mom, okay. which is weird. But uh, I've, I've definitely um, accompanied her on on drums and, and whatever else. But uh, but yeah, she's trying to get me to sing with her right now. Is she? I wrote a song for her. So she was like, we should do it as a duet. I was like, you need to take instruction. I told you she's very, <laughs> she's very opinionated. She has her own ideas. So, but uh, but yeah, drums. Uh, I just, I don't know. Drums just always. I, I like rhythm is is to me that's what life is. You know what I mean? So rhythm has always been. I play rhythm guitar. I can play some lead stuff too. But it's like rhythm to me is is everything. Yeah. Bass, bass, the rhythm section. I think that in a band, if you have a a bad rhythm section, your band is going to be shit too. So <laughs> it's like <laughs> rhythm needs to be on point, you know? That's it. <laughs> so that transience, how do you think that impacted you as a kid? Because presumably you had to make new friends regularly between those ages of, of eight to 14. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, it made it easy to kind of, you know, again, in the industry, it's like you're in one place, when you're on tour, you're here, there, there, you know what I'm saying? One night here, two nights there, maybe. So it made it easier for me to uh, to live this lifestyle, this transient lifestyle, and like, you know, to meet people, to network, all of that. So you just it, it made me uh, more uh, open to meeting people, even though I, I'm, I'm kind of an introvert too, you know what I mean? But within saying that, it's like, you have to be open if you're moving to a new place or else you're not going to have any friends. You're not going to have any experiences. So, yeah. you know. After the break, Curtis talks about the Atlanta music scene in the 90s, touring with CeeLo Green, his solo career, and much more. Welcome back to Humans of Music and my interview with Curtis Harding. Before the break, Curtis was talking about his upbringing and how he moved around a lot with his family. And we pick up the conversation by talking about how that impacted him as a kid and whether music became something he could use to help him make friends in whatever new town he found himself in. I think playing with people is all about communication. You know mm. what I'm saying? So, yeah, you have to you have to be able to uh, to communicate with people in, in that sense. Music to me in large is about trying to provoke an emotion a lot less about talking, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's why I dig instrumentals is because it's like, you don't even have to say a word. It's just like, how does it make you feel? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, so, and that's really the point of, of, of making music to me is just like provoking an emotion of some sort. So. Yeah. What kind of kid were you? Like, what, what would your school reports normally say? Like, were you a good student? Were you, tell me about the young Curtis Harding. I'd say he's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> This kid is this kid has a bright future. He's gonna do something one day. <laughs> I don't know, man. I was I was like any other kid, you know. 
very uh, daring. I took a lot of risk as a kid. In what way? I still do. I just I just wanted to have fun. I was like, oh, if you, are you going to jump in there? I'll do it. I'll be the first one to jump into something, you know? <laughs> yeah. I love being the first. I still love being the first doing stuff. Okay. So that also, you just mentioned that transient sets you up quite well for a musical career. I think that desire to take risks does the same. Yeah, it's the same. It's, and I think with progression in music is like you have to you have to be that person. You have to want to um, take risks. Yeah. Otherwise, it gets very stale and very boring. And just like monotony in, in music is to me is is one of the and complacency is is the is the beginning of the end you know absolutely yeah you mentioned earlier the f- familial influences on you and how the fact that everyone in your family was involved in music um but i understand that your sister's rap cassette collection was also pretty important to you growing up quite influential was that th- was that true i don't remember her having a cassette collection i don't know where to, where that shit came from <laughs> but she was she was definitely <laughs> She was def. She did. She did, she definitely rapped. I remember her, um, her and her friends winning a talent show, um, and they. She had a rap group, and they were like broadcast on like uh, some Good Morning television show, and that was very inspiring. And that's that kind of set me on the path of like, oh, I want to do that too. So, yeah. And is that what you started doing when you got to Atlanta? Oh, I was doing that before I got to Atlanta. I started rapping at like age of nine, so I was doing I was doing that very early on, man like playing drums in church, rapping with my sisters, rapping with friends, singing. I was doing all that shit when I was younger. I just started really playing guitar until I got to to Atlanta, like in my later 20s. Oh, okay. So that's when I started yeah, picking up guitar and stuff. Right. Doing other things. And so is it true that you would also record yourself rapping when you were about nine? You had a karaoke machine or something and you'd make cassette tapes of yourself? Well, the karaoke machine came into play because we would, my mother would uh, do these late night just randomly she would be like, let's go sing to the homeless people on Christmas time or whatever um, because it's cold outside and they need, you know, someone to let let them know they care about them. So we would just randomly just get up and go do stuff like that with a karaoke machine she was set up. So that's where that came into play. But yeah, I would make little tapes too. She wouldn't let me use a karaoke machine because that was her uh, her weapon at the time. That was her, that's what she used for battle. <laughs> Right. She'd go out, you know, but I had my own little cassette player and I would like, I don't know if I recorded myself rapping, but I would definitely record myself just like doing little monologues and stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder about what. <laughs> yeah. You must have seen so early on the power of music, you know, the power to warm people on a cold Christmas night, the the power to move a church, the power to feel that movement yourself. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know if I was really aware of of it at the time but looking back again is like it's it's very powerful mm. whether you believe in that stuff or not whether you believe in god whether you believe i don't know you can believe in nothing but like the power of belief is like amazing you believe in yourself you and you actually achieve the goal that you set for yourself then that shit is amazing absolutely again it's just like you know speaking positivity so you landed in, in atlanta in your mid-teens um what's your path into the local music scene i started just kind of frequenting um, shows of, of bands and just like of, of of groups that I liked. I would just go and hang out and try to get as close to them as I could. And then I started meeting people and formulating my own identity within that, which kind of mirrored some of the stuff that they were doing just because, you know, as a, as a teenager, that's just kind of what you do. But that's how I started, man. Just like just putting myself in situations to where I would be uncomfortable, but I knew it was going to like lead to something good to like a, a a development, you know what I'm saying, that I hadn't reached yet. So that's how it started for me. When you say uncomfortable, like what what situations were uncomfortable for you? Because I didn't really know anybody here. So you you start out going alone. You're going to be uncomfortable. <laughs> it's like if you don't know anybody, then it's like I have I have family, but my family wasn't like interested in follow me around, you know what I'm saying, to these dark clubs and yeah. and these sketchy parts of the neighborhood and stuff. So <laughs> but that's how it started. What, what kind of bands were you seeing? Everything? I was saying everything, man. From from like underground hip hop, mostly when I first started, to like punk bands, to, you know what I'm saying? So it was, it was everything. It was all across the board. Okay. And how old are you when you formed Proceed, which was, I guess, your, your rap collective? 17, 18. Okay. Yep. And what was the the goal? 
to take over the world. <laughs> no, we just wanted to, we were just teenagers, man. We wanted to rap, you know what I'm saying? Like, we really looked up to, like, a lot of the, the Atlanta hip-hop and just hip-hop in general, like Outkast and Goody Mob and, like, a lot of the East Coast, like Wu Tang, like we we love that stuff, man. Hieroglyphics out in the West, West Coast, like we love that stuff. So we just wanted to like do our own thing, like have our own niche. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So what were you seeing in Atlanta? You mentioned Goody Mob and Outcast. Were they just locally available? Would you just see them around? Would you go see them play? Like what was happening in the scene at that time? Yeah, they were they were all over the place. Um, they're from Atlanta, so. Yeah, it's, it, they would do a lot of underground shows, and then they would do like main shows. Um, at that time, um, they were they were all on like BT and TV too. Like that, that was that was what was uh, happening in Atlanta. They were the ones that were kind of putting Atlanta on the map. So they were they were the the go to bands to see at the mm. time. So that's where we were. Did the fact that they were from Atlanta and they were doing well did that give you a belief? that you could also do something if you saw the other hometown people doing well, that, that, oh, maybe I can do this. Definitely, definitely. And they were so personable, like, you know what I'm saying? And they looked like me, you know what I'm saying? So it was just like, it was a reflection. It was, I, I saw myself, so it was just like, it was a beautiful thing. It still is a beautiful thing. Mm. I encourage anybody that doesn't know anything about uh, about them to, uh, to check them out. Yeah. So any young people. You, you joked earlier, I think you were joking, about world domination being your ambition but did you have ambition <laughs> at that point were you an ambitious person at that age yeah i'm still ambitious it wasn't to take over the world though not in that sense it was just to to make some good music that people dug and that we dug you know what i'm saying mm. i think like w when you're younger you really don't know what you want to do clearly because i i didn't become like the the rapper that i thought i was going to be even though i got good at it and i'm still pretty good at it <laughs> but but yeah man it's just like you you it was just like you add a different facet on to, uh, to your skill set. It's like, it's like martial arts. You master one craft and then you do something else and you add it on to your repertoire. Sure. And you become better. And so when you start doing promotions for La Face, the record label, La Face, mm -hmm. um, is that, are you, again, trying to put yourself in a position where something may happen for you? You're trying to put yourself in positions where you're exposed to these people, where you're around these people and, and moving in their orbit and therefore that might help you with your music career? Yeah, it was all of that, man. It was, a lot of it was like, hey, we can we can do that, and we can also get into some free shows. You know, we can we can brush elbows with these people. We can learn a lot. So mm. I was always curious and wanting to learn, and I'm still that way. Right. You know, it's like I'm I'm always trying to put myself in a position to learn around people that are are better than me at something, so I can you know it's very selfish <laughs> in that sense because <laughs> because I, I want to soak it up and I want to learn as much as I can because I don't have any formal like musical education. Yeah our education period other than just like reading and just like going to public school. But yeah, yeah it's, I'm always trying to put myself and I've always been that way to try to learn as much as I can. So what, what were some of the lessons that you think you learned doing that? Cause you were doing promotions for the label. Is that right? You would do street team kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just a lot about that, just about the industry, about how to promote, promote a band promote, um, which in turn taught us how to promote ourselves, like merch and all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, there's all of that, man. Stage performances, everything. Like, you know, it, it's, it was a uh, one-on-one -on -one and just like how to put yourself out there. Mm. And that label was started by Babyface and L.A. Reid. Did you ever meet mm -hmm. either of them? In passing, yeah. Okay. L.A. Reid was around. Uh, he was around quite a bit because we would have to go to the label sometimes. Um, they used to have an office off of uh, by Linux, Linux Mall out here. Mm -hmm. Uh off of Peachtree Street. So we would go by there quite a bit to pick up things and, you know, just to try to be around as much as we can. Okay. We used to just make excuses up just to go by there, you know, <laughs> just to see who, just to see who was there. I wonder who's going to be here today. You yeah. Know? That sounds incredibly <laughs> exciting to have that at your fingertips. Yeah, that's what Atlanta was in those days, man. Okay. Um, it was the beginnings of just like, you know, the groundwork for a lot of the stuff that's coming out of here now. Um, sure. So yeah, man, it was an exciting time. Yeah, and I've I've asked you several times throughout the interview about things that you've learned, um, and I'm going to ask you again because your next step, I guess, was hooking up with CeeLo Green mm -hmm. and singing backups with CeeLo um, and rapping with him on the um, his album CeeLo Green and his Perfect Imperfections, and touring with him as well in around 2001, 2002. Mm -hmm. That must have been a steep learning curve to be exposed to that level of professionalism and to be an actual touring musician. 
Did we, can you can you sort of put your finger on things that you learned or things that you soaked up during that time? Yeah, during the recording of that record and just like other stuff that he was doing, um, I would try to be as, you know, a fly on the wall, as close or ask as many questions as I could. Um, but I learned a lot about songwriting, um, about singing. He would always say, you don't don't over you don't have to over sing a song. The whole point is just again to just like to sing it with feeling, you know what I'm saying? So I learned a lot about, you know, musical development just being around him. And then touring wise, it's just like, I think the first tour I did with him was a Smoking Grooves tour. And it was Outkast headlining. It was The Roots. It was Lauren Hills. Erica Badu came out. Cypress Hill? CeeLo, well. of course. Cypress Hill. It was a bunch of people. So it's just like to see all these great, you know what I'm saying, acts every night for like a couple months. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's crazy. So that was an institution of higher learning for sure, you know? Yeah. On the one hand, learning how to live on the road for you, learning what it takes to do day in, day out. Well, I already had that. I already I guess, had that because yeah, I was, that's true. you know, I grew up, I grew up on the road. So that was, that was easy. Yeah. You know, but like, you know, being on these big stages was, uh, was an experience and I welcomed it with open arms. How did you keep your head together during that? Because I imagine it'd be quite easy to get carried away. I didn't. <laughs> I got carried away a, a lot of times, but not too carried away to where, you know, I put myself in danger. I mean, I'm sure we were in some dangerous situations at that time, but I mean, I was young. So it's like, you're going you're gonna to do what young kids do. And like, you don't have the, uh, your brain hasn't necessarily developed <laughs> enough to, to realize that, oh, this is kind of, this is not really a good decision. But I was a teenager, I was a teenager, man, so... I was having fun. Yeah. But what's what sort of dangerous situations? Nothing really crazy. You know what I'm saying? You just find yourself in like sketchy parts of the town and city that you didn't really know or didn't belong in. Might have drank too much. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just stuff like that. Just normal shit. Okay. So in some ways, you also learned what not to do around that time. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, you were there for the birth of um, Niles Barkley through your relationship with CeeLo. Yeah. And I guess... Everything that you saw then and saw the success of that band and everything you've just been speaking about then, when you finally decided to go solo, how do you think all that helped set you up for that? Like, how did, did, it, did it help you handle the attention? Did you see how to handle that kind of attention? Yeah, I did. I don't know if, I don't know if they really knew how to handle that attention. Like, any artist, no matter what, man, it's just like, you know, it's a strange thing because you don't really, get, at least I didn't, and I, I don't know that some of my peers, we don't make music to do, like, interviews or, you know, some people want to be famous. That that has never really been like my goal. My goal is always just to, you know, to make the music that I dig and be able to make a living at it and and to continue to do it. And that's why you want to make a living at it. But, you know, attention is a weird thing. It's like once you get it, then it's like, you know, okay, it's great. People are digging the record, but you don't ever want it to consume you to the point to where um it becomes the focal point of mm. what you do. So I think you're always just kind of learning how to handle attention. You know what I'm saying? Because the further you go, if you're really good at what you do and if you're getting better, the more attention you're going to get. And I think the more that you would try to withdraw from that in order to maintain some sort of uh, foundation of, of why it all started. At least that's the way it is for me. Mm. But, yeah, I think that's just a, a, a never-ending journey. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Do you think the fact that you found success as a solo artist in your 30s helped you? With that journey in that regard, it gave you a perspective that if you'd found that success in your late teens as a solo artist, it would have been a different experience. Yeah, I think so. A lot of it was kind of purposely done that way for me. Um, I didn't want to, you know what I'm saying? I didn't want to put myself in, because again, I had did a lot of that stuff. I was like, and I've seen a lot. I was like, yeah, I don't want to burn out, you know, so I'm going to take my time. And mm. I think that uh, within that, I think, I think the guys for that maturity that I, you know what I'm saying, that I had at that that age. And I wanted to get better. Like, I wanted to, like, actually learn how to play guitar and do certain things. So I took some time off to do that and mm. to kind of cultivate my skills. That doesn't mean that I was the greatest, but, you know, I was better than I probably would have been if I would have just put myself, you know what I'm saying, sure. situation. Who is inspiring you as a guitar player? Oh, there's so many people, man. There's a lot. Too many to even name, but I mean, we all we all know the the guys. Like, I think when I first started playing, 
Like when I picked up the guitar, I think I was like a huge, I still am a, a huge John Frusciante fan. Right. Like I just loved his simplicity. I love his simplicity. I loved his like, his pain in his guitar. And I knew he could shred, but he just knew how to just kind of break it down to the simplest forms. Cause I think it's harder to kind of simplify something than it is to complicate it. And I just love simplicity within, um, within his playing and just like still the emotion that you can feel from it. So he yeah. was a guy that kind of was like, yeah, I want, I want to be able to do that too. Yeah, nice. But there's, of course, there's a lot of blues players like Albert King, BB, you know what I'm saying? All the greats, Hendrix, all those. I love all that shit. But like, he somehow was able to kind of encapsulate all of that and put it into one. Yeah. What's it been like for your parents? Do you think to see you have a flourishing musical career? They dig it. They really love it. You know what I'm saying? Like. I think it's something that my mom, she was at least she'll say it's like I've always known. And I was like, oh, sure you did. She must have though, because she was one of the ones that was, you know, pushing me to get on stage and to do certain things. Um, my father as well, like he he loves it. They um they're fans. She wasn't the biggest fan at, at first of some of the stuff I was doing, especially rap wise, because I was doing saying cursing a lot <laughs> when we first started, because <laughs> that's what was cool, you know. But that's just natural for like parents, especially coming from like a church background to kind of, you know, I say, yo, you shouldn't be saying that. But, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> what do you think? Was it difficult, do you think, for her to come to terms with the fact that you were going to head down a secular direction? Um, I don't know. She she would talk about it. I don't know how difficult it was. I think she um, I think she knew that she she instilled what she wanted to instill in me. So. At the end of the day, it's like you have to trust that you're, you've you done the best you can for your kids and really you just got to let them go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because like they're yours, somebody, but they don't, be, you know what I'm saying? They don't belong to you. Like they have their own lives to lead. So I think she understood that. And that's one of the things that she taught me growing up too. So Nice. So when you think back to soul power and you think forward now to if words were flowers, how do you hear the, the progression in your art th uh, between those records? Well, I like to think I've gotten better. I think I was, I've become a better player, um, better songwriter. I'm able to uh, to orchestrate music easier at times. But, you know, from that album, I think what stands out to me most now is that I can appreciate space a lot more as opposed to trying to, like, have competing instruments. I think that the instruments that I use and the way I write stuff now, it complements each other as opposed to like, sometimes there's a lot of competing going on mm. in soul power with instruments. Um, so I think that's the biggest change that I hear. You mentioned that you've written a song for your mom and that she wants to sing it as a duet. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you think will happen in the future? Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> if she can take, if she can take, she can take direction. You know, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to have that role reversal with parents sometimes, man. It's like, come on now. It's like, I know a little something about this. Do it this way. But I didn't write it as a duet. I wrote it I wrote it for her to sing. So, I mean, we'll see. I definitely would sing a song with my mom. She has a beautiful yeah, nice. voice. But not nice. this this particular song is like I didn't write as a duet. Okay. But we'll see. Gotcha. Yeah. Curtis, just before <laughs> we finish up, Jackster is all about giving credit where credit is due. Are there people that you give credit to for helping you get where you are today? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, my mom, for sure. Uh, my parents. My sisters, my brothers, CeeLo Green, Whole Dungeon Family, Danger Mouse, Sam Cohen, as of recent, uh, tons of people, man. Mm. Tons of studios, friends, lots of friend bands, Black Lips, Cole Alexander, Danny Lee from the Night Beats, tons of people, man. They all know who they are. Right. Fair enough. You mentioned Danger Mouse. What what have your experiences with him been like in terms of how he has changed you as a musician? Danger Mouse is just like the great facilitator, man. And he also like, he knows music like none other. He was one of the first tastemakers that I knew. I was like, wow, he, he knows about some different shit. I've never heard this before. I've never heard it put this way. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So Danger Mouse is, uh, has always been uh, a master and someone that I looked up to as a musical curator and as a as an artist and as a producer, and I've always wanted to work with him. So it was a, it was that was a dream come true. Actually meeting him randomly again, um, just walking down the street in New York and connecting with him, and and uh, and in return he introduced me to Sam Cohen, who I didn't even know was going to be involved in uh, the making of Face Your Fear, but I'm glad he did because 
our relationship has just grown and just budded. So Danger Mouse, just he knew from the jump, you know what I'm saying, like what to do, and he still does. So mm. it's amazing. Yeah, and Sam was still involved with the latest record. So that that's a, a long-standing yeah. relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been writing other songs for other artists and doing stuff for video games and everything. So yeah, man. Nice one. It's, good. it's a good one. Awesome. Yep. All right, Curtis. Thanks so much for your time, mate. It's been great to chat with you. Same. Thank you, brother. Appreciate enjoy it. your time and enjoy editing this uh, this interview. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, mate. I appreciate it. Oh, not a problem, man. My pleasure. All right. Take care. All right, man. Peace. And that's it for another episode of Humans of Music. A big thanks to Curtis for his time and thank you for listening. And just a reminder that Curtis's new album, If Words Were Flowers, is out now. If you have any feedback on the show or suggestions on who you'd like me to interview or even if you just want to say hello, please drop me a line at humansofmusic at jaxta.com. That's humansofmusic, one word, at jaxta, J-A-X-S-T-A dot com. This episode was mixed by Lachlan Mitchell from Parliament Studios in Annandale and the incidental music and theme song were written and performed by Sam Lockwood. Please remember to subscribe to the Humans of Music podcast so you never miss an episode or even better, share it amongst your friends and rate and review it. And remember, next time you need to know who wrote a song, who produced a song, who engineered it, who played on it, who sang on it, who did anything on it, head to jackster.com for all your official music credit information. Until the next episode of Humans of Music, I'm Rod Yates. Thanks for listening.